Today, I am delighted to welcome an old friend back to the studio in Stephen Millman, Global Head of Research and Data Science at Dynata. And we're going to pick up where we left off in the recent episode called AI, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Now, Stephen lives and works in the US of A, and when he lands in London, he swings by our studio so I can add chunks of his immense knowledge to our body of learning. I'm always pleased to see Stephen because I always learn so much and he's such a nice guy to boot. Last time I met Stephen, we talked about large language models with specific reference to the open source models, in particular chat GPT. At the end of the show, Stephen mentioned walled gardens and I said then that I wanted to pick that up on a future show and this is indeed that show. So in a minute, we're going to explore what a walled garden is in the context of large language models. But first, I wanted to find out a little more about the work Stephen's doing at Dynata and what cutting edge looks like when you're right on the front line of data, AI, marketing and research. Hello, Stephen, and welcome back to Unicorny. I think we've done four pods together now, but I don't think I've ever asked you what you're doing in the day job. I think we did a little bit in Marketing Trek, maybe when we talked about the work you were doing around expanding cohorts using Facebook, but I think that's as much as we've done. So, in your business today, what's leading edge? What are the applications people are using? I mean, specifically AI for, and what's most popular? I know it's a big question. And it is big because yours is a big company. It's a big company. So at Dynata, if you boil it down to the very basic, our job is to help someone with a question that they need to answer, a decision they need to make, to help them make that be a data-driven decision. Anything we do falls into that category. And so world's largest uh, online panel. So we're a massive first-party data provider. With respect to this question about what's sort of cutting edge in in our space, a couple of areas. Uh, One is our application to data quality. Uh, bringing these really cutting-edge technologies to rooting out fraud, to uh, helping to understand uh, respondent engagement, people taking surveys, uh, whether they're engaged with. So is the data, it's a real person or not a real person, and then is it uh, is that person providing data that we think we can trust or is it, are they not? And there's a lot of very advanced algorithms being placed into that. There's machine learning uh, as part of that to really understand things. If you think about our process, well, it's called quality score, which is about 196 different checks. It's not like we say, well, if you fail five of them, you're, you're done. So there's this machine learning on the background that looks at the intercorrelations between all of these things, and it gives you a really good idea on a person-by-person basis as they're taking the survey. You know, before they get to the end, it's going to tell us that this is really, uh, this is probably valid or probably invalid. We do a lot of work on measuring the effectiveness of advertising. Uh, so we're doing some really interesting things on the creative evaluation front. Uh, is the ad likely to work? Okay. Based on a, a massive amount of prior data. Is your ad campaign in field working? It's actually very, very difficult to stitch all that information together because you can't measure every different media channel the same way. Yeah. So I got to measure TV one way or actually maybe two or three ways. Um, I measure digital in one way, but I can't measure programmatic the way I measure Facebook. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. We also have data representation systems that are quite good that help people understand them. And every day there's some new interesting technology and uh, people, uh, smart people on the product team, smart people on uh, the technology team, smart people on my team, we investigate them. We separate out the stuff that is snake oil from the stuff that is (laughs) real and practical and and is a today technology. And um, we we, uh, build them in. Well, that's great context. Thank you. Now, walled gardens, Before exploring them, I think we'd better define them. So in the context of tech, what is a walled garden? The term walled garden uh, in this context really started to arise with the Facebooks of the world and the social media where they were taking uh, what was intended to be this large democratized information and communication system, the internet, the World Wide Web, and began to cordon it off and make it so that there were these members-only groups, AOL, I think was one of the really early walled gardens. And so this term is now being applied to uh, generative AI in, in two ways. The first is, is that they are constraining what information goes into these foundational models, uh, the foundational model being the model that drives the large language model and gives you the answers you want. So if you look at ChatGPT, ChatGPT is this massive $175 billion 
pieces of information go into it, draws from everywhere on the internet, all kinds of information. And it will do all manner of things that you ask it to do. But if you are, for example, looking for a large language model that is going to help you with diagnosing a patient, it doesn't need to do so in the voice of E.E. E. Cummings or, or Robert Frost. <laughs> it's not an yeah. important thing for it to know. And the more information it has to draw on, in some ways, the more likely it is that it could hallucinate and come up with uh, answers that are simply uh, unresponsive or, or flat wrong. So one way you think about walled gardens is you limit the amount of data inf and information that it has access to in the foundational model so that it is less likely to stray. And I'll give you a couple of real quick examples. BERT is really this kind of a model uh, where they have a, ver a variety of different kinds of smaller, much smaller language models that are really tightly aligned. So there's BioBERT, for example, for biological. There's LegalBERT for legal. So there's those, but then there's also very structured uh, single organization use cases. So if you have complicated products that require a lot of technical support, you might want to train these large language models to help you with a chatbot that are trained on all of your documentation. You might have hundreds of thousands of pages of, of technical documentation for certain kinds of products or services. And if you train the language model very tightly on those, uh, it is much less likely that your chatbot is going to stray off or do something that, um, as we talked about last time, these very large models, they do have bias in them. They can have unpleasant uh, information or false information from the internet built into them. They are representations of uh, all the bad things and good things and true things and false things that are in the training set. So if you exclude all of that and only really allow it to uh, focus in on the documents you care about, um, it's going to be much less likely to present risk to have that be client-facing. The second way uh, people think about walled gardens is locking down your instance of a large language model. So I might be using a commercially available large language model or an open source law large language model, but if I want to build a scaled enterprise solution on top of that, I can't allow the risk that those models might be changed. And you heard in the news recently uh, over the last few months, uh, is ChatGPT getting dumber? Not really getting dumber. They changed the way it was allocating memory and some of the ways that it's approaching how to pull information out. And they were experimenting with different processes like uh, compartmentalizing certain kinds of information so it doesn't have to hit the entire model in order to get information, it can hit little subsets. And as a result, it started to do some things really, really well that it was doing poorly before, but it also started doing some things poorly <laughs> that it had been doing well before. And some of the things that it had been doing poorly were some of the things that researchers were actually testing as a way to see whether or not these models are getting better or worse. So you can't have those models shifting around on you if you're building client delivery on top of it, right? And so uh, Walled Garden is also a way where you can sort of lock down one of these models and not have it be uh, subject to whatever the owners or the producers of these large mo language models are doing. And that makes it a lot safer. Other things that Walled Gardens do for a company, if you make your own large language model platform, is it also allows you to avoid one of the major risks, which is that you are feeding your private information or PII, personally identifiable information or personal health information. None of that stuff can go back to the source of the language model because you're not connected to it. From a commercial point of view, then, wall gardens, uh, number one, it's a much more effective way of getting your specific intellectual property right into a model that can help then service your clients and your business. Yes. Number two, it's going to give you a lot more consistent results, which, of course, consistency is really important when you're trying to build commercial grade applications like that. You're reducing your security risk because it's only your data. So I'm, I'm in security in its widest sense. So you're not going to offend, upset, breach any laws, hopefully, because your data set is your data set. Ideally not. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And you're not giving your confidential information away to competitors. I think how people go about building a wall garden is probably outside the scope of what we're talking about today or what or what they might do to do that. I would say that not a lot of organizations have the uh, in-house capability to do this stuff, but there are now actually an, an expanding number of vendors who are out there building these for you. Yeah, I've seen a few of those start to appear. We use three different vendors, for example, to help produce this show, CapShow, ChatGPT itself, and Fireflies. 
And in my day work, I've also started to see applications that are claiming to be able to use large language models to open up your own SharePoint and Azure knowledge bases. Uh, Sana comes to mind. They're a Stockholm-based uh, Series B AI-powered learning platform, and, and I'm going to look a little bit more into them. Yeah, um, and then there's others out there. I'm, I'm particularly impressed right now by Databricks. Okay. Um, they've got a whole suite of products uh, where they'll handle both uh, your data architecture and the large language model. They bought uh, Mosaic a little while back. And this sort of place to what you were saying last time that a lot of us are using artificial intelligence or that the, we get the benefit of it through applications that other people are building. So we don't actually need to build our own data science or AI department because the applications that we're using every day will just have it built in like Salesforce or Office already does. Yeah, exactly. But like those things, uh, you absolutely have to have staff on hand who understand in, in a great detail how they work. But I do think that as a service, uh, yeah. that's definitely the model where most companies are going to go to. One other thing that just sprung to mind while we were talking then, I was at an event the other night with about 20 other people. They were marketers from different businesses. And the subject of AI came up. And, you know, there wasn't a great deal of knowledge in the room, I suppose, which is understandable, including me, obviously. But the distinction between just having data and being able to analyze data and AI, I think probably on many people was slightly lost. And I just wondered whether we might want to get some clarity because I'm assuming that a lot of people listening to this may not be that data literate either. So in terms of data and data science, I guess that's spotting patterns and correlations and trying to understand causation. Whereas when we're talking about AI, we're talking about learning models that get better without human intervention. Is that fair? I mean, it's all kind of mixed up together now in, okay. in certain ways. There are versions of artificial intelligence that are um, very effective at predicting, and there are those that aren't. Um, large language models are not good at predicting. I was having a conversation with some friends, and you remember when Bill Clinton was running for president, this is dating for a, a lot of <laughs> folks who are going to be listening to this, and I apologize. <laughs> but he had this big sign at his campaign uh, that said, it's the economy, stupid. I printed out one that... Uh, looking for a place to hang it in the office that says it's it's a language model, stupid. Don't expect language models to be great at math. They're not math models. They're language models. Don't expect them to be good at predicting. Yeah. They're not. The big difference is rules-based, business rule-driven models versus models in AI where uh, the system is figuring out how to answer the question without being told explicitly how to come to an answer. And so the, the kind of classic example is asking uh, an AI to figure out if a picture has a cat in it. And so you show it 10,000 pictures with no cat in it. You say, these don't have any cats. You show it 10,000 other pictures and you say, these have cats. You don't tell it what a cat is. You don't describe the cat. You just say, there is a cat in these, there's not a cat in those. Figure out how to tell me on the next picture you see whether there's a cat. And it will do it in ways that a human wouldn't do it. It's also very hard to sort of peel out exactly how they figure out how to do that, but some very smart data scientists and, and AI uh, people have figured out how to extract some of this. And one of the things was is that it was looking at the tip of the cat's ear. There's something about the tip, just that very point of the cat's ear, yep. which would be vir virtually invisible to a human looking at it, that it recognized was in pictures with cats that wasn't in pictures without cats. That would never be something we would think about. And so that's really the difference is that I haven't explained to the computer anything about how to solve the problem. All I have said is I have a problem and tell me how to answer it. Let's move on. And so I think that, that's a really good starting point to look at wall gardens and um, to, the, to understand the concept that your data still needs to stay your data and you don't want to share it with anybody. But of course, you're, you're building it to help you do things which means you've got to build, develop, or, or buy, of course. We've talked about buying applications that have this built in, and then deploy it. And so I'm interested to move on to look in terms of practical applications uh, around marketing and market research, obviously. What kind of models and algorithms are most useful and kind of what the process for building and or buying and deploying these tools might be? First, let me just say, we spent a lot of time talking about generative AI in the last podcast, but yes. the answer to this question is not heavily generative AI. Yep. There's a lot of different kinds of artificial in intelligences out there doing different jobs. And large language models are being now applied to these processes. It's very incipient in most cases. So let me talk about some of the ways that AI are being used and are being very effective in, in, uh, in marketing. 
primarily we're talking about customer targeting, we're talking about personalization, and we're talking about uh, campaign optimization. And if you sort of remember the old adage, as, as we do, uh, you know, getting the right ad to the right person at the right time, solving yeah. those kinds of problems. Give you an idea about a number of different kinds of systems that they're that are commonly in use. So recommendation systems. Anybody who uh, has used a streaming service has been engaging a recommendation system. And I had a really interesting uh, conversation with friends of mine on Facebook today, speaking of Walt Gardens, uh, where someone was complaining that uh, Suits, which is on Netflix now, and it's having a huge resurgence. If you go to Netflix and you look for Suits, the image it shows you uh, is going to be uh, potentially different depending on who's looking at it. And so a friend of mine said, I can't believe that the picture that they're showing me is this uh, beautiful woman in a bra who had literally five seconds of screen time across nine seasons of this show who's not a main character. You know, sort of a blink and you miss it. And I got that. And most of my male friends got that image uh, presented to us when, when, you, when you call that up. But other people uh, got Donna, the, the redhead, and some of the women were getting pictures of some of the men on the show. Okay. And personally, I don't know why I was shocked, but I was shocked at how sophisticated that system is, that it, uh, it, was, it was working to do that. But beyond that, also the more th- standard things you'd expect um, – I watch these kinds of shows. I might very much like these kinds of shows. And it's a way the system can engage you and keep you looking for that next bit of content instead of saying, okay, I think I've exhausted what I want to binge today. That kind of technology is interesting. But I have a, I mean, like Spotify, obviously, is a a classic example. And I know they've just started Daylists, which is, you know, another version of their discovery engine. And it's meant to be you know, having some intelligence, understanding the type of music you like. But in reality, I think the more you listen, you get that mean reversion effect we talked about last time where you actually just get more of the same. And my day lists are very rarely anything that I haven't already listened to. So it's not able to make a leap beyond the music that's already in my library. Yeah, and so training matters, uh, the quality of the artificial engine matters, and whether or not the problem that they're trying to solve is being expressed correctly. So if you go back to the cat example... What I really want to know about is uh, whether there's a cat walking around, and I don't tell it that it matters to me that the cat is walking around. I'm not going to get the right answer. I'm just going to get that there's a cat in the picture. It's absolutely true. A lot of recommendation engines will look at the first set of things that you like. It will represent things that are exactly like them and won't be smart enough to then look for intercorrelations between that kind of content and other kinds of content. And yet, pretty, presumably, yet. yet. Okay. And some of them are, uh, okay. I think. Uh, now, I'm not in the middle of these, yeah. but I will say, for example, um, on Netflix, it will break things out into multiple genres and re- make recommendations across genres based on commonalities. And I assume that's built into their AI. I don't know for a fact, obviously, because I don't work there. But those are the kinds of advancements you'd expect to see in in recommendation systems. In the episode before last, we spoke to Julian Thorne from Subex. That's a company that's marketing a new generation of AI as a service to optimize customer revenue conversions. And they're targeting publishers. Now, sort of instead of the, if you like that, then you'll like this, which is a next best show for you type algorithm, their tech offers a next best message for you to optimize conversion based on some pretty sophisticated parameters. It solves some of the problems around split testing. And there's other kinds of data that they're using other than just I watched this show. So um, a friend of mine named uh, Bill Harvey, really brilliant fellow, uh, helped develop this thing called driver tags. And driver tags, and Bill, if you're listening, I apologize if I get this not quite right, but (laughs) What driver tags are is a series of kind of thoughts and emotions that you can associate with certain kinds of content. And uh, you can also look to see if the emotional drivers of what appears to cause people to want to watch these shows exist in other shows. And that would break these genre questions and things like that. I just want a show that's going to make me happy. Okay. I want a show that's going to make me feel things in my heart. Uh, so that's another great way that you can sort of build yeah. in more information and, and get out of the rut that, that some of these recommendations are definitely in, where it's just saying, if any of you remember what a what a video store was, uh, you know, video rental store, uh, you would just be looking at the thing next to the thing you were looking at. So how are you doing? Ooh, it's good stuff, isn't it? I really liked the idea of driver tags, so as soon as we'd finished recording, I went and looked them up. 
And I've added a link to some of the stuff I found on the main show notes at unicorny.co.uk. Now, it turns out that driver tags are content analytics markers or meta tags that help understand and shape viewing behavior to television and films. And using them, Emmy Award winner Bill Harvey and Bill McKenna turned their attention to advertising effectiveness and they delivered massive improvements in ad performance through helping to find the people who an advertisement would really move and to find the contexts that would most amplify an advertisement. I'm going to dig deeper into driver tags because I've got an unscratched itch around measuring emotional response to communication that I think might just get scratched by driver tags. Anyhow, in the rest of the show, we looked at walled gardens and how businesses might be able to reap benefits of training large language models on their own data. Later on, we're going to look at whether future legislation might make investing in that kind of technology a little bit risky right now. But it also seems that, at the same time, AI as a service vendors may provide a lower entry price solution for most businesses. And we talked earlier about SANA and Databricks. They seem to be like good examples, certainly at the time that we're recording this. Now, I've been a little bit obsessed about this area over the last three years because we've got terabytes and terabytes of data stretching back years. And that data covers highly specific issues in vertical markets like finance, technology and industrial. And I would dearly love to be able to interrogate that data using natural language searches. And it seems that I may soon be able to do just that. Now, if you've been thinking about this kind of stuff too, I would love to talk to you. So please get in touch with me through the website at unicorny.co.uk or via my profile on LinkedIn. Let's now get back to the studio. So right now, generative AI, interesting, everyone's playing with it, but actually that's not the thing that's driving adoption and usage right now. Yeah, and that's because it's new. It's like being in a fancy hotel, uh, but, you know, some rooms are absolute rubbish because they haven't been renovated yet. It's kind of like that. Yeah couple of other areas uh, that this stuff is being used. Natural language processing obviously is used everywhere. It's, on, it's in your phone. Um, just the ability to take unstructured text and analyze it or to take your voice and turn it into text and so forth. Predictive analytics. Uh, there's a lot of AI being used in predictive analytics, not large language models because, as, as the sign says, it's a language model, stupid. Yep. But these use historical data to forecast trends and to make predictions about what's going to happen next. And like the cat example I gave you, it does it in ways where uh, we might not, as a researcher, I might not see that relationship. I might not see the complexity of the intercorrelations, but the AI can sort that out faster, better, cheaper, Okay, and then give you these very reasonable predictions for the future. When you hear about these things, you're usually talking about decision trees and neural networks, uh, that sort of thing. Is that kind of some of the Einstein stuff that's built into Salesforce? That'll be doing some of that, won't I guess, looking at patterns and then using that to try and predict future customer behavior? Yeah, I mean, I would presume that they're using neural networks for that or a decision yeah. tree. The application of it reminds me of what we see yeah, in Salesforce. Yeah, exactly. Um, economic trend analysis, um, the ability to do things like take into account seasonality in your sales cycle and and predict uh, ahead of time what would be a good outcome and what would be a bad outcome. Because if if you're selling candy, um, you know every February sales are going to go up, but you don't know how much. And so the fact that went up, everybody's happy. uh, But if it went up less than it should have, you should be unhappy. If it went up more than it should have, you should be very, very happy. And the dentists might have a different opinion, but uh, that kind of forecasting is, in, in, is absolutely invaluable. So, Stephen, what else are you seeing? What else are people doing with artificial intelligence? Sure. Um, marketing automation. So using AI-driven marketing automation platforms uh, to automate email campaigns. So each email campaign might be a little different for each person receiving it based on what you know about them, what's in your CRM or what's in your lead gen software, et cetera. One more big one I'd like to make sure I talk about our our clustering algorithms. So looking for commonalities between groups that may be hard to identify where, for example, typical clustering techniques like k-means or hierarchical might not find it, um, where there there are some folks finding really interesting results and good success applying machine learning to those. That's a really interesting area. I'm going to go do some research in that. And maybe next time we meet, we can look at clustering techniques because I think that's really interesting, particularly from a marketing point of view as a CMO 
with media fragmenting all over the place, with the 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 remit everyone has to do more with less that kind of technology i think that would allow you to be more efficient in yeah. what you're doing could be really important yeah and it's definitely a growing area in my business we get a lot of requests for uh, okay. custom segmentation let's move on to the more human side of mm-hmm. all of this uh because it's all very well having the technology knowing how to use it is a different thing but if you're going to deliver a campaign as an organization that, that's using this technology, if you're going to embrace it, you're going to have to get collaboration between lots of different types of people who may be working in different types of ways. How are you seeing people effectively build collaborative teams that are embracing all the different skill sets? That's a great question. You've got to make sure that you're fostering collaboration between some folks who don't speak the same language. So between data scientists, between the marketers, between people in finance, between technology. And if you really want to develop effective AI strategies in marketing, you've got to get all these people working together seamlessly. So a couple of really good things to keep in mind when you're doing that. Number one is establish clear objectives. Make sure that everybody in all of the teams understands the thing you're trying to accomplish. If you have any member of the team that can't say in one sentence what you're trying to do, Um, you haven't gotten this step right. Make sure the teams are cross-functional. It is common for organizations to have completely separate chains for marketing, data science, technology, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But if you're going to build these, those folks have to form teams within that. It can't be these blind handoffs from one uh, one step pipe to the other. Get them working together, put them in rooms together, and make sure that you have a team whose membership is clear. Shared data access, it's a silly thing to say, uh, but a lot of times when people are trying to build these uh, systems, one group will have access to certain materials that another group won't have access to, and it leads to, leads to mistakes and failures of understanding. Data literacy and education, um, every member of this team knows something every, every other member of the team doesn't know. Take the time to educate your, your peers in different groups. Your data scientists don't know marketing. Your marketers don't know data science. They don't all have to be experts at everything, but they have to understand the basics. Make sure that you take the time to do that. And then I would say one other thing to keep in mind is, and this is probably true for everything, not just this, prototyping and feedback. So don't build the whole thing and then figure it out. Build a prototype, make sure it works. Have that proof of concept, get feedback, and build and just keep moving through that loop so that ultimately you don't end up having spent a year and build something that isn't going to work for anybody. I guess one other thing I should probably mention is start with some sense of what are the privacy and ethical considerations that need to be uh, sort of carried throughout uh, the entire process. And it won't be clear necessarily from the beginning. So you may need to evolve that. Things like data privacy are going to be very clear, but as you're building out a tool uh, in AI, or with large language models, as this process evolves, you may identify other ethical concerns, or they may present themselves in the results, and you just need to continuously keep that in mind and build that into how you're uh, ultimately going to have a a system so that that system is not going to uh, cause you headaches down the line. As you were talking to me about that and the the development of cross-functional teams, that brought to mind the whole DevOps approach, the Mm -hmm. move from sort of siloed tech development into DevOps. And anyone listening that wants to explore that, Gene Kim's book, The Unicorn Project, I think really talks in detail about how to build those kind of cross-functional teams. So if you're looking to do some extra research, I thoroughly recommend that book, and I'll link that on the show notes. One thing I didn't mention, and I, I really feel like I should always mention this, is when you go through these feedback loops and things work, celebrate. Ah. Celebrate. People get locked. They, they feel like they're locked in a basement and they can't show anything. They can't get any feedback. And it's a grind building these things. Yep. Uh, and when the next component works, take the time to celebrate. <laughs> Tell executive leadership, we've got this great thing. Open a bottle of champagne or you know, get donuts, whatever. <laughs> celebrate throughout the process. Keep people engaged. Keep people excited that they're making progress. Let's now spin on to the future. Ah. We like to talk about the future on this show. Kind of trends and what you see coming down the line. I think when we originally spoke, I said, what do you see coming in the next five to 10 years? But things are moving so quickly, that timeline might, that might be too long a timeline. But like in general terms, what do you see coming down the line? If you'd asked me two years about a thing that I'm trying to build right now, I would have said that's 10 or 15 years off. 
and now it's today technology. So predicting the future, uh, we talked about predictive analytics. I don't know if I can predict the future, but I can tell you, I think, a couple of things that I think are going to be consequential. One thing that has become really clear is people are really working on large language models and trying to trying to find ways to use them commercially is that most of what humans do is not text. Okay. Right? And so I think we're going to start to really move into thinking about how do we train models in multimodal media. So audio like this, video, images, and bringing all of that in together and building models that can pull all of that in as part of their training sets. I think another area that we're going to see is... um, I, I would keep coming back to Star Trek because I feel like we're getting there really fast all of a sudden. <laughs> but uh, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more industries where everyone is going to have a co-pilot. Uh, co-pilot's a common term in in, yeah. uh, in the AI world and particularly in large language models where you've, the models and the technologies aren't doing the job for you, but they are helping you out. And if you, know, you have any Star Trek fans and you think about um, – the emergency medical hologram. And I'm not saying we're going to have a hologram walking around and that it's going to be able to do procedures, but you can imagine a doctor walking around with some device that they can ask questions to. Are there any medications contraindicated for the one I want to give my patient? I think that's going to become ubiquitous uh, in, in, okay. in a lot of different jobs. And I think the other one, and I know this is sort of a weird thing to think of when we're talking about uh, AI, is sustainability. It's not necessarily commonly understood, but these language models are enormously computationally intensive, and these computers necessary to produce them require excessive cooling and a lot of electricity. If you take a, a small language model uh, like BERT, which is trained on 110 million parameters, they estimate that that consumes about the same amount of energy just to train that model. Uh, as it would if you took a transcontinental flight, if you flew from Los Angeles to London. Now, if you look at one of the big ones like uh, ChatGPT, so ChatGPT3, I don't know the numbers for four, but I was reading this earlier. ChatGPT3 uses 175 billion, billion with a B, parameters. And to train that, it's estimated uh, that it consumed 1,287 megawatt hours of energy, of electricity, and generated 552 tons of carbon dioxide. And if you want to put that in context, that's about 123 gas-powered cars operating as they do typically in the U.S. for a whole year. Wow. So I think the other area we're going to go to is how do we uh, – build these models in computationally more efficient ways where there's going to be less impact because it is weird to think about AI being ecologically dirty, but it, it is the case right now. Yeah, no one really thinks about that. At the time, I remember thinking it was a bit of a reach where someone was talking about how email was effectively ecologically unfriendly because you think of it, of course, being electronic on the screen. But of course, there's a, as you say, there's a lot of power going on. Now, take that to a power of, and you've got AI, which you know I know just, just a query on Chat GPT is meant to be 10 times more resource hungry than a query on Google. What about things like regulation? I know the UN General Assembly is struggling to agree. I know there's been lots of talk about, you know, do we take a six month development moratorium because we're worried about the pace this thing's gathering? I think we touched on regulation maybe very briefly previously. I'm sure the EU is gagging to get out and put some regulation out. Where where do you think we might get in the next few years on that? Yeah, well, I mean, the uh, European Union's um, law on AI. Uh, that one's going to come out, I think, I want to say next year, or I think it comes out next year, goes into force next year. I'm not 100% certain. Uh, that one is is sort of tightly tailored around the most concerning things, things like the use of facial recognition and uh, the ability to produce fake news, uh, misleading information at scale. Yep. It's really focusing on that kind of stuff. The UN is struggling. Uh, I know in the United States we're struggling. The challenges uh, I think that we're going to have to face and I think we're going to start seeing come up in law are going to be things like, can we know transparently what the models are doing? Can we prevent bad things from happening by knowing what's going in? Right now, there's very little transparency. And of course, there's very little known about how these models actually are producing what they're producing. It's Again, it's a strange thing to say, but they talk about these as emergent yeah. properties in the same way that they talk about consciousness as an emergent biological process. It does these things, and we can repeatedly do these things, but we don't know exactly how they're doing them. 
And that obviously raises concerns. And so there may be consideration for laws around what kinds of things is it okay to allow to be done this way and what things are not. You know, if you think about this as, a, as an analogy, if you think about the level of statistical significance, if I want to be confident that an ad is helping me sell orange juice and that it's effective, I can be 90% confident. That's okay. But if I want to be confident that a vaccine works and that it doesn't have <laughs> deadly consequence, I need to be a lot more certain than 90%. And so I think what's going to happen is there's going to be fields where there may be a lot of regulation about how these things are used until they can be transparent and we can understand how they work. The reason I ask about things like regulation, of course, is if the future direction of regulation is unknown, that is likely to put a dampener on investment, like commercial investment in this kind of technology. But I guess like the starting point for most people isn't going to be in contentious areas. It's going to be, as you say, as a co-pilot to deliver better or improved service or lower cost. It's not going to be, or it's unlikely to be, certainly with good actors, it's unlikely to be anything that's going to fall foul of future legislation. I would like to believe that's true. I'm an optimist. <laughs> it's my job but to be an optimist. I have to say, I'm not sure that I, okay. I think that that's true. I think absence of regulation leads to a Wild West approach. Yep. And there's definitely a lot of um, emerging players who are cash grab. And I think we are going to see a lot of people taking advantage of the absence of regulation to do bad things that will make them money, just like we have mm -hmm. before drugs were regulated, before doctors had to have licenses. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I meant good actors <clears throat> being reluctant to invest in case regulation made their investment redundant. But of course, and I did, I, I, in fact, someone was commenting on one of our previous threads and pointed out fraud GPT to me. Yeah. Um, and other such things that I'm not going to publicize on this podcast. I agree with you. I think good actors will, will, will be reluctant uh, to engage certain of these groups, but there's a lot of money being yeah. spent by people who don't have great intention, as, as always. Well, there you have it. I love speaking to Stephen, so much so that when we'd finished recording the show, we went to the local pub to have a pie and a pint, and we carried on talking for at least another hour. And this is such a fascinating area that, like Depeche Mode's 1981 hit from the Speak and Spell album, I just can't get enough. I just can't get enough. So here are some things I'm going to think about more after today's show. Firstly, we need to differentiate between the various architectures and methodologies that underpin these kinds of systems. Stephen pointed me to the distinction between rule-based models and the more contemporary models that learn without explicit programming. Rule-based models function on predefined instructions, so they produce consistent results, but they can be limited. Whereas large language models and the like generate their responses from vast data sets, evolving their outputs as they go based on the information they've been trained on. What's particularly fascinating and perhaps counterintuitive about these expansive and evolutionary language models is they're non predictive. As Stephen said, it's a language model, stupid. So despite their ability to generate impressively coherent and contextually relevant responses, they explicitly cannot forecast future outcomes or trends. Their strength, therefore, is not in prediction, but in synthesizing, understanding, and generating language based on their training. Now, that makes them powerful tools for a range of applications, but completely useless when it comes to thinking about the future. If you want to get into the realms of predictive analytics, you're going to need to use rules-based models. Next up, as Stephen was speaking to me about the cross-functional nature of teams needed to commercialize AI in your business, DevOps came to mind, and I mentioned Gene Kim's business novel, The Unicorn Project. I just think that might need to be explained in a little bit more detail. So DevOps, here goes. Right, DevOps first appeared in 2009 when Patrick Dubois found a better way of managing software development and IT operations. DevOps emphasizes collaboration, automation and continuous integration. Its core is about breaking down silos between the different departments and skill sets needed to code and bring an app to production by fostering a culture where teams work in unison 
towards common goals. It's also about important things like decentralizing and allowing decision making closest to the point of pain. The Unicorn Project is a seminal work on this subject and it illustrates how successful the approach can be in transformation. Now, the lines between traditional software development and AI implementation will, in my opinion, begin to blur. The complexities of AI projects, from data handling to model training, will require a seamless integration of very, very diverse skill sets. And that is where the principles of DevOps come to the fore. So, by fostering a culture of cross-functional collaboration, you can ensure smoother AI project rollouts, faster iterations, and more reliable results. Why the hell does this matter to marketing? you might be screaming at your earbuds. Well, because DevOps cousin is RevOps. It's the same thing applied to customer lifecycle, and it needs a cross-functional approach involving sales, marketing, marketing operations, and customer success. Now, with AI in the mix too, your cross-functional team just got bigger. Study the DevOps transformation, and you'll be equipped for your RevOps transformation too. Well, that is enough for today. Each episode also, by the way, comes with an accompanying blog. You can find that blog either on unicorny.co.uk or on stateofdigital.com. And we also sometimes publish a newsletter on LinkedIn, but your best bet is either Unicorny or State of Digital. Now, we're going to link both of those in the show notes. And by the way, the blog to support this episode is about the environmental footprint of AI. I think it's going to surprise you, so be sure to check that out. Thank you for listening to today's show. It's up to you, but most people subscribe and review after listening to two episodes, and you can do that on this pod platform. You can also register at unicorny.co.uk. You can leave us a voicemail there too. The button's on the right-hand side of the screen, and we'd love to hear from you. So if you do do that, mm, we'd be really grateful. But that's all for now. So thank you, and we'll catch you next time. Mm-hmm.